Look, it's easy to blame the pharmaceutical companies with profits valued far above patient outcomes. I could also easily blame our leading medical journals for hopping into bed with the pharma companies to drive profits of their own, but at the end of the day, it's our fault. These companies don't sell any drugs without us prescribing them. And for some reason, we keep falling for their crap. We keep pushing useless or even harmful drugs with absolutely no evidence. We waste tremendous amounts of money, and in most countries, that's taxpayer money, money that could be used to fix our broken healthcare systems, but instead, it's funneled into the coffers of these massive for-profit corporations. And this is all in the name of drugs that do nothing, or even worse, that might hurt our patients. Think Paxlovid, think Tamiflu. And this time around, we're going to talk about Endexinet Alpha. Look, there is absolutely no reason that anybody should be prescribing this. There's absolutely no reason that any hospital should be paying for this. And yet my hospital has stocked it for years at a cost of many thousands of dollars a dose. So let's talk about this utter debacle of evidence-based medicine. Welcome back to First 10 EM. Honestly, Endexinet Alpha is a really cool drug. It's a really interesting technological approach. So it's really unfortunate that it's failed, but so far it has. The world has moved on from warfarin for anticoagulation. They go by a number of different names, but the DOAX or the NOAX direct oral anticoagulants, things like rivaroxaban or apixaban have clearly at this point taken over. At some point, if you'd like, we could go back and we could look at all the evidence to see if it really supported that wholesale switch over to these DOACs. But there's no doubt that they're easier to prescribe and easier to take. So definitely at this point, they're my go-to. Of course, when they were being introduced, the emergency medicine community was pretty nervous. The side effects, massive bleeding often into enclosed spaces, that's, that's scary. And while everybody will be prescribing these new drugs, managing those side effects, that falls squarely on our shoulders in the emergency department. With warfarin, we had reversal agents at least, right? We had just got used to prothrombin complex concentrates, PCCs, over the older and rather annoying FFP. And on paper, honestly, they looked great. Realistically, outcomes were still really bad for all patients who had been bleeding heavily on warfarin. So even though we had reversal agents, that argument might have been a little overblown. Either way, along come these new agents. And although they are easier to use, there is no way to turn them off. And very quickly, every emergency doctor saw patients with very bad outcomes. And so... There was a lot of excitement when a potential reversal agent was announced. And Dexanite, honestly, is a very interesting drug. It acts as a decoy. It's essentially an artificial copy of factor 10A. And the idea is that it binds up all of that 10A inhibitor that's out there. It sequesters it and so immediately turns it off. And so on paper, it makes a lot of sense. And honestly, the early in vivo studies looked good. They looked at biomarkers, of course. So there's the Anexa A trial, and in that trial, Andexanet Alpha restored thrombin generation in 100% of healthy volunteers who were on apixaban. The Anexa R study, which looked at rivaroxaban, uh, the lab numbers got better in 96% of healthy volunteers. A very promising start, but lab values, surrogate outcomes, they really don't tell you a lot. And when you're messing with the coagulation system, adverse events are common. And so it's really important that we look at clinical outcomes from this new, honestly, experimental agent. And this is where the data has fallen down. Until just a few months ago, the only clinical trial that we had was Anexa 4. And I'm not sure it's even fair to call it a clinical trial. It's a drug company run trial. In fact, the drug company didn't just run the trial, they designed it 
They prepared the statistical analysis. They interpreted the data. They hired a medical writer to write up the results. Yeah, conflict of interest is going to be a huge issue, honestly, with all of the data that we have. Anyhow, an exa 4 was an open label observational trial. And here's the kicker. Here's the turn point of everything. They didn't even include a control group. So they just took a bunch of adult patients with major bleeding who had taken either a Pixaban, or Rivaroxaban, or a Doxaban in the last 18 hours, and they gave them indexinate, and they looked at outcomes. They enrolled 352 patients. Of the 352, only 254 were included in their efficacy analysis because 100 patients had very low anti-10A blood levels. Now, in the real world, we can't measure anti-10A blood levels, which definitely means that outcomes will look worse in the real world than they will in any trial. Now, factor 10A activity was reduced in all groups. But the problem is, given that this is a new agent with a new test, we have no idea what that surrogate outcome means. For their other co-primary outcome, and there shouldn't be more than one primary outcome, but but for their other co-primary outcome, 82% of the cohort were judged to have a, quote, good, or excellent hemostasis, and that was based primarily on either a hematoma size or a hemoglobin drop. Now, this outcome is problematic for a couple reasons. First, it's a subjective outcome in an unblinded trial run entirely by the drug company trying to sell you this very expensive chemical. Uh, Very expensive for sure, but very lucrative uh, for them. Second, there's no comparison group. We have no idea what this means at all. It's quite possible that a group of patients given placebo would have had identical outcomes. Hell, they might have had better outcomes. We'll come back to that, but this data tells us nothing. I have no idea why this trial was approved, nor why it was published in the New England Journal. Well, I do know, but it wasn't for scientific reasons, if you know what I mean. In terms of other outcomes, 34 patients, that's 10%, had a thrombotic event at 30-day follow-up, and there were 49 deaths, that's 14%, at 30 days. And that's despite patients with an expected survival of less than one month were specifically excluded from this trial. These patients were not supposed to die, and yet 14% died. That actually sounds bad to me, although I'll admit predicting 30-day survival is difficult. But also... If the point of this agent is to reverse anticoagulation in critically ill patients, why are you excluding everybody with any risk of death? That would only make sense if you were designing a trial with motives that were not purely clinical, if you didn't care about patient outcomes. This trial wasted everybody's time. It tells us absolutely nothing. It is very thinly veiled advertisement in the most obvious way. And despite that, the medical community said nothing. Our hospitals shelled out massive amounts of money for this completely unproven drug. At the time of this trial, this agent cost between twenty dollars and $50,000 a dose, and there was zero evidence of clinical benefit. Look, you can't blame the drug companies. They have one purpose and one purpose only. Patient health doesn't come anywhere into it. They care about their shareholders and their bottom line. That's how companies work. That's how we should expect them to work. So we can't blame them. The massive waste of money after an XF4 was entirely our fault. Now, my conclusion at the time was a very clear conclusion, and that was that indexant alpha should not be used clinically based on this data that we should wait until we see the results of RCTs. We should not have been prescribing this. We should not have been paying for this. For what it's worth, the Canadian Drug Agency, CADTH, recommends that indexinate alpha should not be paid for with public drug uh, money. But despite that, every hospital that I work in stocks this agent at tremendous cost. Now, finally, in 2024, We actually have an RCT, which is why we're making this video. We have the somewhat confusingly named Anexa-1 trial. Yeah, Anexa-4 was published many years before Anexa-1, whatever. So Anexa-1, this is an industry-funded, open-label, multi-center RCT. 
They initially included uh, all patients who had an intracranial hemorrhage who were taking a factor 10 inhibitor and you would have had to have taken your most recent dose within 15 hours. However, one of the many problems with this trial is that they made multiple amendments to the study over time with no real explanations in the manuscript, which is very concerning when the trial is completely run by the company trying to sell us this drug. You can read about the details of that if you want in the first 10 EM blog post linked or just read the publication yourself if you want to. So they took these patients with head bleeds and they randomized them to either indexinate in both a high or low dose range or to usual care. And that's our next problem. This was an unblinded trial, no placebo. That makes absolutely no sense. This isn't something complicated to blind like dual, sequel, uh, like dual sequence defibrillation, right? This would have been easy to blind. A blinded trial is clearly the standard and the lack of blinding introduces so much room for bias. And again, this is a trial with tremendous financial conflict of interest. Now their primary outcome was hemostatic efficacy at 12 hours. They use a different definition of hemostatic efficacy than was used in the initial, the Anexa 4 trial. But unfortunately, it's a little unclear when that definition was instituted because it's not listed in the original clinicaltrials.org listing, and it was only added to clinicaltrials.org after the majority of patients had already been recruited. Now, in terms of results, it gets a little bit complicated. When I teach evidence-based medicine, one of the keys that I try to get across is to simplify the results section. There are often many, many results presented to you, but it's important to focus. And of course, there's always going to be a primary outcome of the trial. That's what the trial was designed for. And it's important to look at that. However, if the people designing the trial are trying to mislead us, this is an outcome that they control. And so it is more likely to be biased if that's what they're trying to do, which is why I always teach my students to look for at least two other key outcomes. And to think about those outcomes you know, before you even start reading the paper. So first, what is the outcome that is most important to you as a physician or to your patients, really? Is it death? Is it neurologic outcomes? Whatever it is, cut through all the other crap presented, right? Forget about the CRP, the length of hospital stay, the hematoma sizes. Focus on what you actually care about most. And as a doctor, you're well trained to think about what that is. And then number two, always remember to look for harms. Every medical intervention causes harms, but trials tend to underestimate harms. Manuscripts often downplay harms. So that's the key. Think about the benefits you care most about and compare those to the harms. And so with that as an introduction here, this trial planned to enroll 900 patients. They stopped the trial early after 550, 452 were included in the actual primary efficacy analysis. The median age was 78, sort of what you expect. Median baseline NIHSS was nine in both groups, they're matched. Uh, patients were enrolled about two hours after symptom onset. Baseline hematoma size was a median of 10 milliliters. Surprisingly, at least to me, only 10% of these bleeds were traumatic. I gotta tell you the vast majority of patients who I see with a head bleed on a factor 10A inhibitor, they're associated with a ground level fall. So this does not fit well with my practice. 80% um, of the intervention group got the low dose indexinate and then 86% of the usual care group received PCC, almost all of which was four factor. So what are the actual results? The headline news that you will hear, you will hear advertised everywhere is that this was a positive trial. Their surrogate composite primary outcome of hemostatic efficacy was better with indexinate, 67% versus 53%. Now, unfortunately, the only component of the composite outcome that was actually statistically positive was hematoma volume, which is actually the least clinically important component of that surrogate. So we have a primary surrogate outcome in an unblinded, heavily conflicted trial. But what about the outcomes that we actually care about as doctors or as patients? And this is probably the most important point. All clinical outcomes, what they refer to in the manuscript as safety outcomes, look worse with indexinate. 
There was a statistical increase in thrombotic events overall. It was uh, 10% versus 5%. Uh, ischemic stroke was also statistically higher when given indexinate, 6.5% versus 1.5%. MI and death were also both higher with indexinate, although they weren't statistically so. The trial was stopped early. In their post hoc analysis using a 30 day modified Rankin score to, effect, uh, to look at functional outcomes, there was clearly no benefit. So it was 31% of the control group having a favorable outcome as compared to 28% of the indexinate group. So at the end of the day, we have a statistical improvement in the surrogate outcome of hematoma size, but we have long term functional outcomes that are completely unchanged, which tells you the hematoma size was completely irrelevant. The surrogate didn't matter because it didn't affect long-term functional outcomes. And every other clinical outcome here was worse. There is clear harm with an increase in thrombosis, an increase in ischemic stroke, and MI and death both also look like they would be higher as well if this was a bigger trial. Considering that this is an open label trial, entirely run, entirely designed by the same company that's trying to sell you the drug, a trial with high risk of bias, with significant conflict of interest, and it's showing us that this very expensive drug clearly causes harm, probably results in worse overall clinical outcomes. There's really only one answer here. No one should be using this drug. No hospital should be stocking this. Nobody should be paying for this. Even if this was independent data, this would not be convincing, right? When you overlay that significant financial conflicts of interest, the conclusions are clear. This is damning. Nobody should be using indexinate alpha. Outside of, you know, future independent research, sure, there's still enough uncertainty here that future research is warranted to allow for future research. But there is definitely no reason to be using this agent clinically in 2024. Sadly, medicine doesn't seem to like to listen to science. Despite this clearly negative data, hospitals will buy this drug. And once it's bought, I guarantee you there will be pressure to use it. I've already received multiple emails from my hospitals about guidelines for expanding the use of indexinant alpha. And so in a pattern that we see over and over again in medicine, the drug company will profit massively, but our patients will probably come to harm and we will have nobody to blame but ourselves.